Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen, Executive Director of the Government Accountability Project. We'll be discussing in just a few minutes how blowing the whistle permanently put to rest a White House agency. But first, the Federal School Meals Program. It feeds 31 million kids a day, but it suffered numerous worrisome foodborne illness outbreaks, according to a recent series in USA Today. Joining us to discuss the state of school food safety are Peter Eisler, a co-author of the USA Today series, and Sarah Klein, Food Safety Counsel for the Center for Science in the Public Interest. Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you. Peter, let's start with you. Uh, how big, quantify, is this problem of foodborne illnesses in the school meals program? Well, there, uh, we looked at data from the Centers for Disease Control over the period from 1998 through 2007, and they documented at least 470 outbreaks of foodborne illness in schools, and those outbreaks sickened about 23,000 children. Um, conventional wisdom is that, that those figures uh, really only hint at the overall problem because many of these cases go unreported and to some extent undetected. Um, Conversely, it's impossible to know how many of those outbreaks are linked to food that's provided by the federal government, which provides about 20 percent of the food that is served in schools, and how, much, how many of those outbreaks are linked to food that is purchased directly by the schools themselves. But those are the, those are the kinds of numbers that we're looking at. And Sarah, what are the common pathogens we're looking at, and what are the sicknesses that attend to them? You know, we could be seeing everything from the fairly mild, like norovirus, which we typically think of as the stomach flu, um, which causes diarrheal symptoms, which can lead to dehydration and, and other more serious complications for young children. Uh, but we could also be looking at our more dangerous pathogens, such as Salmonella or E. coli 0157H7. And, uh, and those can, can be and, and often are deadly, uh, especially for young children. 31 million kids a day are fed through the school meals program, Peter. Huge number. And you're saying that there are um, a significant number of foodborne illnesses associated with that and, and perhaps substantially higher than what we know statistically. But is it really greater than the number of foodborne illnesses associated with supermarket food or restaurant food? When they document an outbreak in the overwhelming majority of those cases, they never figure out where the food came from. Um, or even if they figure out where the food came from, which food in particular uh, that was served at that particular establishment or bought at a particular establishment actually was the, uh, was the vehicle for the illness. So th there's no real way to make that sort of a determination. Um, what we do know is that um, the uh, overall in this country, I, I think that, that it's something like 76 million cases a year of foodborne illness they believe are occurring. They don't, but, but the reporting statistics only hint at that number. That really is just an estimate. Okay. One of the companies that you looked at was one called Beef Packers Incorporated, a uh, company that is a supplier for the school lunch program, but has had a recurring problem with salmonella. Tell me about that. Yeah, uh, Beef Packers, which is a company based in California, has had several major recalls of ground beef because of salmonella contamination. And in at least two of those instances, uh, you know, there have been multiple illnesses associated with that. The uh, uh, what we found was that uh, during the most recent big recall of beef packers ground beef, which was this past summer, they recalled um, over a period in the summer, and during the recall period, they, they only recalled the ground beef that had been sold commercially. During that same period, they did not recall ground beef that had been produced for the school lunch program, even though that beef had come off of the same assembly lines in the same plant on the same days or during the same period as the beef that was recalled. What was the rationale for that? The rationale was that they had tested the school lunch beef for salmonella during that period and had only found one batch that tested positive during that time. That batch was rejected. The other batches were allowed to go through. The concern that that raised when we spoke to uh, scientists and food safety experts is that the testing for salmonella is notoriously spotty. Ground beef is not a homogenous product. It's made from 
you know, multiple pieces of multiple animals can go into one package of ground beef. So if you take a sample of that ground beef and you test it for salmonella, just because you don't find any in that test is really no guarantee with any degree of certainty that there is no salmonella in the beef. Um, people who were formerly associated with the school lunch program and a, and a number of food safety scientists we spoke with uh, believe that all the ground beef that was produced at that plant during that period should have been recalled as opposed to just the stuff that was sold in supermarkets. Now, salmonella does cook out if cooked at a high enough temperature, isn't that right? It does. Salmonella, if, uh, if, if uh, beef is properly cooked, uh, 160, 165 degrees, uh, internal temperature, it will cook out salmonella. The problem, and this is particularly a concern within the school lunch program, is that unlike, say, a fast food chain where they have tremendous control over everything that happens throughout the process and the way the beef, beef is cooked and they have timers and they have specific temperatures and it, there's really a, a, a great deal of control. With the school lunch program, this, this beef is going out to tens of thousands of schools across the country and there's, there's, there's a tremendous degree of variance in terms of how well the people are trained in those schools you know, what, uh, how, how they're handling the beef, how well they're cooking the beef, and so forth. So, uh, while... All right, so what, during this time, the school lunch program continued to use this um, ground beef that some batches had been associated with salmonella from uh, Beef Products uh, Incorporated. However, during this time, did the government cease to make purchases from beef products uh, in the face of evidence that its products were contaminated? No, they did not. The government continued to buy the ground beef for the school lunch program, even though they knew that salmonella had, was in that plant and had been found in that plant during the time that that school lunch food was produced. And why would they do that? Uh, well, again, they, they said that the, the beef had been tested for salmonella and that they had, they had one batch had tested positive and they threw out that batch and all the other batches had not, they had not found evidence of salmonella when they tested the beef and therefore they felt it was okay to go ahead and use it. I guess you already told me that and I st still hadn't registered <laughs> why they went ahead and did that. Um, it's not just ground beef though and it's not just US USDA dropping the ball. There's problems also with tortillas. You uh, flour tortillas from Chicago's Del Rey Torteria. Uh, tell me about that. Well, yeah, uh, you know, our, the way our, our, our food safety system is, is set up, there are essentially two different regulatory bodies that, I mean, there are multiple regulatory bodies that have a piece of that puzzle, but there are two that have primary responsibility for doing inspections at food manufacturing plants. Uh, the USDA, which actually runs the school lunch program, is responsible primarily for meat and poultry. Um, and the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is responsible for m m much of what remains. So um, one of the things that we found was that uh, FDA, when they were finding, when they were identifying facilities that had food safety problems, was not checking to see if those facilities had been providing food to the school lunch program or directly to schools. And when it even did stumble on evidence that a facility of concern was providing food for school lunches, it did nothing to alert USDA or to get that word out to the schools themselves. So one of the cases that we focused on was the case of a company called the Del Rey Torteria, which is based in Chicago. And um, they first had their products associated with illness in schools in 2003. They made some students, a bunch of students sick at some schools in Massachusetts. There was another incident in 2004, another in 2005. In 2006, the FDA, having noticed this problem, did an internal study in which their scientists concluded that um, something in Del Rey's tortillas was likely to be making children sick but they did not release that study publicly. They did not alert anybody to their findings. They, so schools continued to buy tortillas from Del Rey and there were more outbreaks. And in fact, it wasn't until early this year, 2009, um, so five years after these things had started to make kids sick, that the FDA finally um, went to court and took legal action to have the plant shut down until or unless they could fix their problems. And ultimately the plant did fix their problems and they're back in business now and there have been no more 
illnesses associated with their tortillas since then. And uh, Sarah, can the public, can the government, can the schools adequately trace back to the source, mm. the pathogens, mm. where they come from, and to find out why it's happening and to get them out of the system? You know, unfortunately, trace back is a, a serious problem. Um, it, it starts with the way, as, as Pete mentioned, the way that outbreaks are discovered. Uh, you need two or more people to be classified as an outbreak. And um, when they're being investigated, they need to have stool samples or other kind of material that a state health department can report to CDC as having found evidence that the same thing that's making this child or this person sick is what's making this other person sick. Uh, that's when you can really begin to start uncovering, okay, they both have symptoms of salmonosis, let's check, take a look where could they have, have eaten in common, that kind of thing. So it's very difficult from that level. And then in terms of school lunch program, there is no great system for discovering where products have gone, where um, if a producer has sold the school lunch program, uh, which schools have received that material, what warehouses are they sitting in. Um, and so it becomes very difficult even when you know that there's a product, for example, um, the beef packers product that, that we know had problems, uh, was recalled commercially and, and still uh, went out to the school lunch program, was dispersed widely across the country and uh, sat in warehouses unidentified and depending on how long it's been frozen could even now be served to our children uh, in schools and we just don't know where it went because there is no good system for um, kind of looking either forward to see where product is going or after there's been a problem looking back to see where it came from. And does uh, the USDA, or does FDA for that matter, publish a list of companies mm. that have a history of problems with pathogens? No, unfortunately we have a lot of problems getting that kind of data. We have um, significant hurdles to overcome when you're looking for either inspection data to see whether a company or any company has a, has a history of safety problems because a lot of that is considered proprietary information. They often include... It's uh, proprietary that they've been cited for having safety violations? In the inspection reports they often include data about the recipes or the processes that they're using to produce the product. And that Whatever happens to black ink to mark out the recipe and just include you know, the information. You know, they to do some of that. Um, one would think that you could redact just, you know, the recipe for whatever the product is and you could retain um, those things that are that are critical for parents and for decision makers who are, who are using this information to know. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't really been the case. I think Pete was able to get um, some information through the Pre Freedom of Information Act, but it wasn't without hurdles that he also had to go through where they attempted to, to hold, withhold information and then he had to go back and say, you know, I know you can give me this information. So it, it's certainly not as transparent as we would like it to be or as the Obama administration has pledged that it will be. Uh, we hope that that is going to improve in the next couple of years as the administration really gets, um, gets its footing in transparency issues. Um, but it's it's been a historic problem, and and you well, know. Well, let's in, talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack has made some forthcoming statements in this regard, um, as has the Deputy Commissioner of the FDA, Dr. Mm -hmm. Joshua Sh Sharfstein. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, uh, are we on the right road now? I think we are. Um, Dr. Sharfstein has been really committed to doing a transparency initiative at FDA, and uh, and he's convened a group of. Uh, of experts from different fields, um, food, drugs, medical devices, to talk about ways to be more transparent in, in each of those industries. Um, USDA faces a difficult problem, which is always that it's, it is both charged with promoting U.S. agriculture and with policing U.S. agriculture, and that's a difficult position for, for the department to be in. Uh, on the one hand, they are... They you could are, call it a conflict of interest. You know, um, some might, yeah. They, they are closely aligned with the industry, and, and they are you know, their mandate is to promote that industry, and yet you're also asking it to, to punish that industry when it does something that's inappropriate. And so that's very difficult and has historically been a problem. Um, and there are, there are structural things at USDA that are making it even more difficult. For example, that FSIS, so the Food Safety and Inspection Service, which is the safety arm of the Department of Agriculture, is not the one that does the testing for the school lunch program. That's over at the Agricultural 
marketing service, keyword. And so um, one of the difficulties is why do you have safety tests going on at the agricultural marketing service instead of at the food safety and inspection service? And so these are things that need to be streamlined. Well, finally, um, parents who see this are probably going to be pretty mm -hmm. alarmed uh, if they didn't already know about the jeopardy the school food system is in. And so, um, Peter, what do you recommend to parents, to schools, uh, that they can do in the short term at least until there's some kind of uh, national improvement in the program? Well, there, there are a number of things that parents can do. I mean, obviously, the, the, the best way to be sure about what your child is eating is to pack it yourself. Um, that is not always possible. Up, upwards of or around 60 percent of the students who participate in school, the school lunch program in this country are eligible for free or reduced price meals because their family incomes qualify them. And that, in, as President Obama has said, for many, many students, uh, these meals are perhaps the best and most wholesome and nutritious meal or the only real meal that they will get during the day. So if you look at it that way and you say, okay, if, if a student is going to get their lunch at school, what are some of the things that parents can do? Well, one of the things that we found is, um, you know, food safety is something that you can look at at many levels. And you can look at it as we've been discussing mainly here in terms of how, the, how and where the food is manufactured and where the food is produced. But there's also this big issue of how the food is handled and prepared once it gets to the schools. Um, uh, the, the federal government requires that all schools that participate in the school lunch program, which is virtually every school in the country except for some private schools, um, uh, and, and even many private schools participate in the program, they are required to have their school cafeterias inspected twice a year by the state or county health department. And they look at things like uh, do the people working in the cafeterias understand how long meat has to be cooked and what sort of procedures do they have in place for training people to ensure that they do that and that they're wearing gloves and that they're washing their hands. You know, the most common foodborne illness in schools is norovirus, which some people think or uh, call occasionally cruise ship virus. That is an illness that mainly comes from the way food is handled. Um, once it gets to the school. Now many of these employees are poorly paid. They can ill afford to take off days sick uh, in order to stay home to avoid passing on their illnesses. What do you do about that? That is certainly a problem that we have seen. We have seen and we have identified specific cases where hundreds of kids were sick in a, in a given school because a food service worker came in when that worker was sick. Um, and in some cases, as you point out, they may not have the sick leave or they may be part-time workers who, uh, you know, if they don't show up, they don't get paid. So there's very little incentive for them to stay home when they're not feeling well. Um, so one of the things parents can do, these cafeteria inspections are public and they're supposed to be provided, the results are supposed to be provided to anyone who asks on demand by the school. So they can go into the school, they can ask to see the cafeteria inspection reports, they can see how the school is doing in that regard. So that's one thing that they can do. Another thing that they can do is they can talk to the administrators of the school lunch programs in their schools. They can try to figure out where the food is coming from. As, as Sarah pointed out, with the food that's being provided by the federal government, it is virtually impossible for the schools to know where that food is coming from. But for the food that the schools are buying directly, it is more feasible. And in some school districts, uh, in Berkeley, California, for example, they have done some very interesting things in terms of trying to buy local um, and to establish relationships with local farms so that they have a very clear idea of where the food is coming from and how that food is, is, is manufactured or produced. And those, you know, so just getting involved in those kinds of levels are other things that parents can do. Sarah? You know, I think it's important for parents to let their representatives know um, that this is a critical issue for them, uh, that despite um, the, the money that, that is spent on the school lunch program, we're still talking about producing a meal for, you know, under $2 um, in most cases, and that, that we can't sacrifice safety um, at, the, at the altar of price, and that parents really care about that. There are a few champions out there in the House and in the Senate right now who are really focusing on this issue. But if parents let their representatives know that food safety, and particularly school food safety, is important to them, that goes a long way. 
Um, I think Pete's right that, that looking to see if that inspection report is available in the school and if it's not, you know, parents can complain. Uh, the One of parents' strongest uh, allies is, is being able to band together, the PTA, um, and, and being able to say, we're not happy with what's going on in our schools. And if you're not seeing that inspection report or if you're seeing it and it's not good, um, then it's time for you to say something. Uh, your child's health could be a risk. Well, thanks to Peter Eisler of USA Today and Sarah Klein of the Center for Science and the Public Interest for joining us to reflect on the state of the school meals program. We can do better. When we return, how blowing the whistle blew the top off a White House agency. Back to Whistle Where You Work. In 1969, the Carter administration created a small agency with the purpose of fostering short-term executive exchanges, bringing private sector executives to work in the federal government while sending federal execs to work for private corporations. In 1991, George Herbert Walker Bush shuttered the President's Commission on Executive Exchange in the wake of whistleblowing by our guest, Gordon Hamill. Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. Um, how did you come to be employed by the President's Commission on Executive Exchange? Well, I was originally at the General Services Administration and uh, GSA had the uh, statutory authority for the presidential transition. So uh, I was detailed over to the presidential transition uh, where I met the future executive director of the commission. That would be Betty Hyman? Betty Hyman, right. And after that, uh, uh, she asked me if I wanted to come on board there and offered me a promotion, so I said yes. Mm -hmm. And so tell me day to day, what did the commission do? Well, and what did you do? I was the director of executive placement, and basically um, I functioned kind of like an employment agency. Mm -hmm. I would solicit uh, executives from the private sector and find them places in the public sector and uh, take executives from the government and send them out into private industry. Mm -hmm. And in the course of your work, you be started to feel uncomfortable that some rules weren't being observed? Well, they were running the commission kind of like a club fed. It was, uh, you know, even though it was a commission, it still had to operate under federal mandates for various things, i.e. procurement. And uh, I was a trained procurement officer and the only one there. So when I started to question some of our expenditures, it kind of upset people that were there because they were used to spending money and uh, not being accountable for it. And so what kind of expenditures are you talking about? Uh, well, we had a, a three-week annual trip for the uh, participants in the program, and that was overseas into Europe, uh, or China as the case may be last time. But, um, you know, our execs would fly first class. We would hire people to schlep their bags around, things of this nature, when federal employees had to fly coach and carry their own bags. Mm -hmm. And so, who did you raise these concerns to? Well, initially I took them to Betty. Uh, you know, I told her that uh, at some point in time somebody was going to question what was going on and that we needed to get straight and, and uh, you know, have some rules in place and, and follow the existing federal rules. And uh, she, initially she said, yes, do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. Our chief of staff uh, decided that he didn't want to do it that way and he felt the commission was special uh, so he decided and informed all the staff there to just go ahead with business as usual. 
Hmm. I had a conversation with him and I could see it was going nowhere, so I took it to the Inspector General at OPM. Mm -hmm. And what was the response there? Big mistake. <laughs> Just to, uh, initially... OPM being the Office of Personnel Management. Right. Initially, the Inspector General conducted a uh, cursory investigation mm -hmm. and uh, released a report which was excoriating. I mean, it made me look like a criminal. And uh, subsequent to that, there were some regressions. And in what sense? I mean, what, what could you have possibly done? Oh, they, they claimed everything from uh, malfeasance to sexual harassment, mm -hmm. uh, none of which was true mm -hmm. and has since obviously been proven. But um, they, they came out with this report, and it was such a bad report mm -hmm. that uh, during the congressional hearings on the issue, the inspector general was forced to withdraw the report in its entirety. Mm -hmm. He said that uh, it was flawed and uh, it, it had been done by an untrained investigator mm -hmm. and things of this nature. So he pulled it back mm -hmm. and um, he promised Congress that he would redo it. Mm -hmm. he, what he did do was uh, he brought in a detailed investigator from the Department of Labor, a guy by the name of Dave Shank. And um, he made a mistake because he brought in probably the only uh, honest federal investigator that was involved with this fiasco. And Shank uh, reinvestigated the charges and came up with nothing new. Mm -hmm. Nothing had changed from the first investigation. Well, what happened to you in all of this? Uh, I lost my job. They, they Tell me about that. You, you were first put on administrative leave, right? I was on administrative leave uh, for four months before they told me why I was on administrative leave. And tell me about how you were removed when you were put on administrative leave. I was taken out of my building by the uh, Secret Service police. Yeah. Asked to leave the building and... Uh, ushered out. Ushered out by the police. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you're on administrative leave for four months and then... Well, I was actually on administrative leave for close to a year by the mm -hmm. time everything was done, but it was four months before I was ever notified why I was on administrative leave. Mm. By that time, they were, they were busy trying to uh, fill in all the gaps and they were running around talking to people and trying to get uh, statements and affidavits that would, uh, you know, support their position. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they did get a number of them. They got seven or eight of them uh, from various places and things of this nature. But they were all determined to have been uh, sought after by Betty Heitman after I left the commission. Mm -hmm. Now, Betty Heitman, what was she doing mm -hmm. before the commission? And she was the co-chair of the Republican National Committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know for sure, but I was told that uh, Mrs. Bush had some concerns with her because she had some personal problems and didn't want her to be in a position of strength in the government, so President Bush appointed her the head of the commission. Now you mentioned before that uh, you went to the IG. Mm -hmm. uh, you, this was also investigated by OPM, is mm -hmm. that correct? Um, and all of that was kind of charges, counter charges, he said, she said sort of stuff. Um, but where you found champions was really in Congress, is that right? Yeah, I was very, very fortunate. Um, I knew some people up on the Hill, uh, some staff people, and I, I uh, contacted them and asked what, what I should do, and they, they told me. Mm -hmm. You know, I pursued it a little bit farther, and, and uh, um, they actually uh, had some hearings on it. Mm -hmm. And um, my assumption is I wasn't around with the Government Accountability Project at the time, but that GAP might have played a role in that as well. GAP played a huge role. Tom Devine uh, babysat me while I was going. Tom Devine, legal director. Legal Government director Gap. at GAP, yeah. I was, I was having a very, very tough time. The stress was getting to me. Everything was getting to me. And Tom called me up one day and said, you know, you got to just buck up. It's going to be tough. It's already been tough. And it's not going to get any easier. I don't have time to babysit you, buck up. Mm -hmm. And that was the best advice he ever gave me. It got me off the telephone. And uh, Tom just spent untold uh, number of hours pursuing my case and writing briefs. And God, I can't remember half the things he did. I just know that uh, he mm -hmm. spent a great deal of time there. And tell me about the congressional investigations. Well, the congressional investigators actually found that everything I said was true mm -hmm. and everything Betty and her people said was false. Mm -hmm. uh, Who conducted these investigations? 
not the investigators themselves, but under whose aegis? Which that was uh, former Congressman Lantos. He's mm -hmm. he passed away last year. Mm -hmm. It was his subcommittee that from California, that, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he was incensed about it, as I was. And uh, his staff on the subcommittee conducted the investigations, mm -hmm. and they were the ones that really found all the holes in the in uh, OPM Inspector General's report. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, during the hearings, it was it all came out during the hearings. Yeah. Now, this was vindication in the sense of your story prevailed in the congressional hearings, but you didn't get your job back. And in fact, the commission itself was dissolved by President Bush the first. That's correct. Uh, that came about as a, as a um, result. My private attorney was conducting. Um, He was interviewing the the uh, people that were involved in the case, mm -hmm. and uh, the Justice Department had assigned a, a lawyer to it, mm -hmm. and she didn't like what she was hearing during the interviews, mm -hmm. and and uh, so she called a halt to them at lunchtime, on May second. In the afternoon, we were notified that the commission no longer existed. She had called the White House and told them that they were losing. The only other thing they could do was abolish the commission. The president did it by executive order. Amazing. <laughs> it truly is. And so, uh, life after the commission for Gordon Hamill? Well, I, uh, I, I did get back into the uh, federal government. I, um, I went to the Treasury Department where, coincidentally, I found the same thing happening. Uh, you know, these people were spending money left and right. Uh, you know, they weren't following any of the established procurement regulations. As I say, I was a contracting officer, so mm -hmm. I knew what we had to do and what we couldn't do. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes to hear that when you tell them what you can't do. Mm -hmm. So um, it basically, it happened all over again. And this time, though, um, they were trying to run me off by trying to turn the people in the organization against me. They actually had secret staff meetings and instructed mm -hmm. them not to deal with me, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, not to deal with me, not to provide me any of the special policies that they were operating under. Some of the people did though, and when they handed them to me, I realized that you know this had to go forward mm -hmm. to the Treasury Inspector General, and uh, I gave it to them. They conducted an investigation they found that my charges were correct, mm -hmm. and uh, in both cases, both the Treasury Department and the President's Commission mm -hmm. were forced to change their policies on procurement and follow the federal procurement rules. We're just about out of time. Real quickly, any regrets that you were so outspoken? No. I, you know, a long time ago someone asked me the first same question, mm -hmm. and, and I said that I would never do it again. Mm -hmm. But I realized that somebody has to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of people out there that you know, care about what they're doing, care about the taxpayer's dollar, mm -hmm. just care about working in an honest environment. Mm -hmm. So I did it and I don't regret it now. Well, thanks to Gordon Hamill for joining us to discuss the volatile history of this little agency that time may have forgotten, but that he surely has not. I'm Mark Cohen, and this has been Whistle Where You Work.